Howdy. Uh, the purpose of this lecture is just to see a little bit about what do we do with diffraction data. And one of the most important things we use diffraction data to tell us is what phase or phases are present. So remember, a phase is a material that has a particular crystal structure. Um, and as we spoke before, uh, we can treat uh, the um, diffraction spectra uh, as, as a fingerprint. Um, and e what that means is that each of these peaks is associated with a particular family of planes. Um, and that family of planes has a particular despacing. And so because we've run many, many, many uh, diffraction runs before, we basically have a very large database out there of you know, what despacings I would expect to see for a particular phase. Um, and so if I just collect some data like this, this could represent one phase, it could represent a couple. Um, but one of the things I'd like to do is say, given these despacings, what does it match up with? Um, and so we can kind of talk through that, how that happens. Um, uh, just a, you know, a quick note that again, if this is, um, maybe this is something that you made in the lab, you're trying to figure out a particular process. Uh, if you're a geologist, maybe it's something that you scooped up uh, from some sediment somewhere. Um, you know, people even do diffraction in uh, sort of crime scene analysis to figure out what kind of uh, clays or dirt uh, were associated with a, you know, maybe a muddy footprint. In all these cases, the sample that you measure, in many cases, it's composed of a couple different phases. And so each of these phases represents some volume uh, of the sample. And so, you know, maybe is responsible for uh, a few of the peaks overall. Um, so how do we determine what phases are present? Um, so traditionally, uh, we use what's called a PDF database. Now, this does not mean uh, Adobe Acrobat PDF. This is the powder diffraction file. Uh, and so this is basically a format that was adopted very early on, you know, way back when we didn't have computers. These were originally cataloged in very large books. I'll show you an example of one of those uh, in a little bit. Um, but basically, all it gives you is a peak position and a relative intensity. Um, and so if we look at this example, so this is an example for uh, iron chromium oxide. Um, and uh, we expect there to be a whole bunch of peaks. Um, and the first peak is at a two theta position of 24. So that's his peak here. Um, and that's corresponding to uh, an HKL of 0, 1, 2. So it's even telling you what family uh, of planes uh, that that represents. Now, some of these uh, PDFs are not even indexed, so you might not even have good HKL values, but the good ones should be. Um, the other thing it tells you is the relative intensity. And so remember, this is a powder diffraction file. And so if the material is a powder and it's randomly oriented, then what this means is that the highest intensity peak, this one that's it's here, should be given an intensity of 100 or 100%, and everything else is normalized relative to that one. So this first peak we see, the peak that labeled peak 4 here, uh, has a relative intensity of 45. Uh, the numbers, I've just ranked them in terms of their highest relative intensity, so that's uh, the peak at 33.4 degrees, the second highest relative intensity, 35.8, and the third highest intensity is somewhere down here. Um, so from this information, you can basically um, treat it as that fingerprint. Uh, and so what we would like to do is check the position and relative intensity of the known peaks for known phases and see what is our unknown material match up for. Um, so here's an example data set. This is actually a spectra from the beginning. Um, and we can kind of work through this you know, pretending we didn't have computers, pretending we had to do the old school search and match. And the computers basically just do the same thing. They use a sophisticated algorithm to do it. Um, so what we basically want to do is we start looking uh, at the low angles and we'll, we'll ignore little tiny blips like this that are on the order of like one or 2%. We're only gonna look at the primary peaks. And so the first despacing I see is 3.46, and then I see 2.54, 2.37. Now, the thing that's important to understand is that, you know, there always might be a little bit of offset in your system. And so when you look, you can't look for a phase that is exactly 2.3730. You have to assume that it's plus or minus, you know, um, uh, a couple, maybe even a tenth of an angstrom or, or definitely a few hundredths of an angstrom. Um, so all of these are distances in angstroms, by the way. 
So what does it look like? Let me uh, close out here. Uh, we'll discard that. So this is an example uh, of a page from that book. I have one uh, on my shelf. <laughs> I don't use it very often because we all use computers now. Um, but they're basically, it's showing you um, different phases and they're ordered by the first peak you would expect to see and then the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. And so this page is showing us peaks where the, uh, or samples where that first peak is anywhere between 3.49 and 3.45. So if you recall, our first peak was at 3.46, so it's, uh, our, our peak would be somewhere in this range. And again, we have to say plus or minus a few hundredths of an angstrom is, is acceptable offset. So what we want to say is then, okay, let's scroll down the list and see phases where the second peak is about 2.54 or 2.55. So if I look at this second column, these are all too large, 2.73, getting smaller, getting smaller. And then somewhere down here, 2.56, 2.55, down to 2.50. So I think our phase hopefully is somewhere in this range. Um, the next peak is at 2.37 and then 2.08. So if I look for things starting here that are about 2.37 and the next one would be 2.08, those are kind of too far off, that's too far off. But here I find something that could be a good match. So the first peak is at 3.48, well we've measured 3.466, that's pretty close. The second peak is at 2.55, 2.5429, that's pretty close. Similarly, 2.38, that's one hundredth of an angstrom off. 2.08, uh, that's spot on. Uh, 1.74, 1.60, and from here on out, it's basically icing on the cake. So this can tell you that this is really among the, you know, and, and now we know of hundreds of thousands, millions of phases. Uh, we didn't know quite that as many when, uh, when this volume was printed, but you know, at least tens of thousands of phases were collected in here. And among all of those, this is the only known phase that could be responsible for all of these peaks. Um, and that's important, because if you just have a good overlap between one or two, but there are a bunch of peaks that aren't really explained, then, then you know, what you're probably looking at is a combination of a few different phases rather than that one particular phase. But you know, what we can tell from here is that this particular phase, uh, it hits all of them, um, and there, there are no, no um, uh, diffraction peaks we would expect to see in aluminum oxide that we don't see in our pattern diffraction spectrum. So that's the important thing. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is, this is just the PDF file for that um, particular phase. And so we do see that there are a couple um, a couple of these uh, very low intensity peaks, which weren't necessarily uh, listed um, on the on the um, the catalog, but that but that's fine because we would get confused and we might not even see something that has a relative intensity of two or one um, on your ordinary diffraction spectra. Um, okay, well, what happens if there are multiple phases? So the general idea is that you're going after the largest phases first. Um, and so let's see, let's say that you sort of line this one up nicely with germanium. You're trying to match with other phases or, or other of the peaks. Maybe this one also lines up with germanium. Maybe these two are also all associated with germanium, but we haven't explained uh, any of these phases yet. Uh, and so, you know, what that means is that, yeah, it looks like this sample is mostly germanium but there's some minor um, secondary phase that we have not yet accounted for. So then we can cancel these uh, peaks out, check them off, they're done, they're accounted for, and let's move on to the next highest peak. So maybe that would be one of these guys down here or here. Um, and in this case, if I start there, then I can actually, um, I, I would go back to the last spectrum that I showed you in it, and all of these other phases match up very nicely, or all of these other peaks match up very n nicely with the AL203 peak. Um, you could go further. So maybe there's still a couple peaks that aren't explained. Um, in this particular spectra, um, there was a little bit of residual aluminum present in the sample as well. Uh, so basically it's an iterative process, um, but this is how the system works. We know enough of these phases out there that it's pretty easy to do search and match and start identifying the phase that we're looking for.